Hello, I'm Elle and welcome back to my ethical fashion YouTube channel where I upload every Sunday. So, ah, uh, the gaze of the man on the female body. This is what we're going to be talking about because it relies both on gender and sexual ideas that support racialized patriarchy, which are both part of colonial and racial hierarchies. Our patriarchal society is sadly one that tries to own women's bodies in countless different ways, from micro offenses such as the assumption that a woman dresses up and puts on makeup for men, and even using women's bodies as weapons against themselves. And I've noticed that women grow up struggling to trust their own body signals and to trust their own distress and discomfort and learn to adjust to the patriarchal gaze. And I use the term patriarchal rather than merely male, so the male gaze, because the patriarchal gaze is a systemic way of seeing women that is internalized. And the male that we're talking about can very well be the straight white man looking at all types of women through a lens of sexualization. And fast fashion has not gone untouched by the male gaze, it can be argued that it was very much built from the gaze of men and white businessmen are often the CEOs and top corporate leaders of major fashion brands that we purchase our clothing from. And so in this YouTube video, we will explore what the male gaze is, how it is interpreted as the patriarchal gaze in more detail, and what the female gaze is and how this all relates back to the fashion industry currently known as fast fashion. So what is the patriarchal gaze. To understand this gaze, we need to understand the male gaze. So according to Laura Mulberry, she coined the term male gaze in the early 1970s because of a world she saw ordered by sexual imbalance. She noticed that this was split between male slash active and then female slash passive. She called this gender power asymmetry, a controlling force in cinema constructed for the pleasure of the male viewer, which is really deeply rooted in patriarchal ideologies. Women's bodies no longer remain bodies. They become dehumanized in film, so women can facilitate men's stories by devoiding them of their own story and their own personality. So essentially the male gaze relies on this power and also of surveillance where the gaze of the male makes the person who is the object of it objectified and controlled. It takes on an authoritative nature that dominates and the control controlling male behavior seeks agency of the female. Women, therefore, are often made into objects against their own will, rather than having the ability to have their own agency. And so, an authoritative female threatens the fragile male gaze, which needs to make those he gazes on to remain subservient in order to remain powerful. John Bergram, author and art critic, he contextualizes the hetero male gaze when he explained that men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. The surveyor of women in herself is male, the surveyed female. Thus she turns herself into an object, and most particularly an object of vision, a sight. The male gaze can be argued to be an omnipresent narrator and an all-powerful cultural gaze, which are both implicitly male. Women often begin to oppress and objectify themselves in signal of societal norms to do so, and sadly, beauty standards and fashion standards often reinforce patriarchal standards, making it impossible to completely escape the male gaze. It is also worth noting that it has been theorized that the gaze changes as the patriarchal structure changes. So let's get into colonial males and the patriarchal gaze. Okay, so but what do we mean by patriarchy, the male gaze and the patriarchal gaze all combined together? So the patriarchal gaze can be interpreted as a means to institutional and legal controls to maintain racial hierarchy, where sexual control has a component in achieving this. If you didn't know, white colonialists use patriarchal governance when dealing with African Americans and Indians to practice three core ideas. White men's sexual privilege and power, righteousness of white men's leadership, and denigrating the sexual and gender mores of people of color. So in the 18th century, the influence and control of Indians and African Americans' sexual and 
gender mores were critical to increase white power over both groups. This shows how intimately connected the sexual and gender hierarchy were with the racial hierarchy in early America. So colonialists basically guarded the color line, punished fornication, and inserted themselves as authority figures in African Americans and Indians' intimate family affairs. And this is good context to the female gaze, which is essentially resistance of the patriarchy. So in the progression of liberation and freedom, the female gaze has emerged as a sign of resistance of the male gaze. It pushes against the subjugation of female bodies, and a lot of women explain that this is an attempt to fight against the authority of the patriarchal male gaze. And so you can argue that the female gaze is a feminist practice where the female gaze examines the power structures present and attempts to change the way of being and looking in our society that's expected of us and sees what the male gaze overlooks. And the female gaze has also been described as living outside the realm of sexuality and a way to survey what's going on without seeking any form of control. The male gaze cannot enter the female gaze, which can allow the female to finally control her own body and soul. And it is very much a path towards self-discovery because it has the ability to comprehend, see, and feel what the male gaze cannot see. In addition, the female gaze has been claimed to see the truth beyond illusions and pretenses that dominate female thought from patriarchal systems. It is a window into women exploring their own sexuality and their own individuality, truly disrupting standards of power and control ever present in our lives. So how do we confront the female gaze in midst of fast fashion? Despite the female gaze emerging, some have argued that it is not the direct opposite of the male gaze. If it was, it would mean straight white hetero women empowering themselves and other women like themselves. However, it excludes within the conversation queer women and trans women and the privilege and resources it takes to develop the female gaze. And we therefore need to consider what the female gaze really means, both in societal terms and aesthetically. The female gaze also has argued that it shouldn't justify sexualizing men to obtain their power back. It would feed into the same line of thought, essentially, that contributes to patriarchy. In addition, every individual is different and interprets womanhood differently. The female gaze shouldn't be monolithic, nor be expected to look and feel the same for every female. So it argues that we may need to be wary that the female gaze does not become equated to the feminine gaze, which is when peak femme aesthetics and clothing becomes its markers, such as Barbie. This may very well enforce societal ideals and what it means to be female, what it means to be beautiful and valid, and also plays into dominating gender aesthetic. However, in defiance of oppressive gender norms and expectations essential for us to achieve this resistance. And let's explore the female gaze in fast fashion. So the female gaze can be practiced in a lot of different ways within the fashion industry, like how we consume clothing and how we style ourselves. However, the challenge is that most of the fashion we're exposed to comes from fast fashion brands that are led by these powerful billionaire white men. And they rapidly produce cheap clothing from the exploitation of garment workers, often located in the global south. And this allows them to extract immense amount of resources and profit from their suffering. And this is called fast fashion. And this can be argued it has been built by pe the patriarchal gaze, the system where what we wear is the gaze and therefore continues to uphold it. So to rebel against the patriarchal gaze and therefore fast fashion, we need to re-envision what clothing and fashion is and how to consume it. It requires us to reconsider what it looks like as well and who it serves and how we can participate in it. And I think this really forces us to use the tools of oppression and control to become tools for our own self-liberation. And although we can't completely escape the patriarchal chokehold, we certainly can try to no longer buy from fast fashion brands that uphold current fashion and beauty standards. And I feel like this is really important because fast fashion relies on consumers to believe the ideals and norms that continue to make us feel like we're not good enough nor worthy enough for society. And so this leads into a call to end fast fashion. The need to challenge the patriarchal gaze and the dominance of fast fashion within our society has really never been more urgent. As consumers, we possess the power to reshape the narrative being fed to us and to dismantle the oppressive structures perpetuated by systems and therefore the fashion industry. And it's crucial to recognize that the issues surrounding fast fashion extends far beyond environmental applications. They encompass social, economic,
economic and cultural dimensions that contribute to its inherently exploitative and destructive nature. So I encourage that we embrace the principles of female gaze. We can reshape our approach to our clothing consumption and redefine fashion as a vehicle for empowerment rather than exploitation. And this involves shifting the focus from mass production and uniformity to inclusivity, sustainability, and unique individuality. And as we begin to question the conventional beauty standards enforced by the fashion industry and other systems, we begin to pave a way for more intentionality and more of a diverse and representative vision of beauty and acceptance where we all celebrate all body types, ethnicity, and identity. Choosing to disengage from fast fashion also signifies a refusal to support an industry backed by marginalized workers, which is only essentially perpetuating cycles of poverty and inequality. So instead, I call that you redirect your power towards sustainable and ethical alternatives that prioritize the well-being of both people and planet. By doing so, we not only resist the patriarchal gaze, but also actively support initiatives that respect human rights. So I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts before I end the video. So we also must acknowledge that liberation is also an ongoing journey and involves unlearning deeply ingrained beliefs and behaviors and actively participating in crucial conversations that challenge the status quo. And by fostering a community of conscious consumers who engage in thoughtful dialogue, we can collectively work towards dismantling these foundational toxic beliefs that have built fast fashion for what it is today, while also nurturing a new paradigm of fashion, one that is empowering, liberating, and inspiring for all of us. And yeah, it's really not what we wear, but more about our perspective and our choices that matter and shape the world that we want to inhabit and see and what we want for future generations to come. So I wanna leave you with all these thoughts. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe and put on your notification. And I would love to have you in my community. So feel free to comment below what you thought of this week's video and what you would like to see in the future. And peace and love. Oh.